Hello guys, I'm really, really, really lucky to get there. Not only have we got one person to come and speak to us today, but we've got two. Um, we're going to be talking today about working with non-specialists um, in our department, which sociology is notorious, not, not just our subject, but lots of other subjects, to have non-specialists and really sort of understand how we can support them the best we can. So, so we're very lucky to speak to Keris, who's in her third year of teaching, who's hugely passionate about sociology and the reputation of sociology within our school. So firstly, thank you for coming on our first day back in INSET, back into school today uh, to speak to us. Thank you. That's no problem, no problem at all. Oh, amazing. Thank you. And we've also got um, Paula speaking with us today, um, was a former head of sociology, um, head of department, a sociology teacher, but now works as a teacher a, t a content head of content for the teacher development trust is that, i've got that all right there's a lot of information i was making sure i've said every bit of information so very well experienced there. so first of all thank you ever so much for joining us today no problem at all i'm just really excited to get to back to my roots and talk about sociology again ah excellent so why don't we do that straight away so first of all we talk about non-specialists what does that actually mean because sometimes that might have a negative connotation looks to the heads of departments i know that paula if i come to you first you were a head of department when you hear the word non-specialist um some people might be like oh my goodness this is terrible what i'm going to do with a non-specialist i mean first of all what what does that mean to you to have a non-specialist in a department to me, on a very basic level, it's somebody who just doesn't have a degree in uh, sociology, it doesn't have the background or a related subject area, so it just doesn't have kind of the foundational knowledge that um, kind of somebody who would have studied a degree in sociology or related area would actually have. Um, so it's it's that kind of, there might be kind of elements and gaps in knowledge that you'd have to work with, but I think the other element is that you have to be open to somebody can come um, from a different subject area with a completely different perspective as well so you have to be open to kind of while it might seem non-specialist might seem negative uh, have negative connotations with it it can also bring a lot of richness and a lot of depth to um kind of what you're teaching as well um so i had a, a theology uh, graduate come and join me and whereas she wasn't her background wasn't in sociology but um things around family and households there was so much parallel there because she was teaching um, religious education that she could pull across and she had expertise beyond what i might have in that area as well so it's uh but looking for the kind of the bright spots in what um yeah what yeah, I like the way you referred that as bright spots. And then you also said that they can bring a richness to your curriculum, that they might not have a specialist in sociology, but like you said, as someone that has a background in theology, I know that I've sort of looked at the, the RE scheme work and it has a lot of elements of the family unit in that. And obviously uh, there's Marion Cross, obviously, to the beliefs unit. I'm um, coming to you next, Keris. Um, you were talk, we also talk about non-specialists. I know you talk, you teach across two, I've sort of mentioned that you teach sociology, but you also teach geography. So you're someone that straddles across two departments obviously your background mm -hmm. is in sociology but you'll you know what it feels like maybe to be a non-specialist in inverted commas um so what does that feel to be a, a non-specialist and and how would you like to be supported i suppose there's two sort of questions there um in terms of specialism and non-specialism especially in my if we look at my sociology department first i'm obviously i'm not head of department i'm one of the new members i suppose i've been there a year and um my head of department is actually the head of psychology as well so she was sort of because of arrangements with the school that we're in um sort of cohort with i suppose in collaboration with um they wanted us to have the sociology department so it was kind of thrown into our school and during the covid pandemic so it was all it's all quite a new department and given the fact that she teaches psychology which is i believe is quite different sociology is more scientific and more black and white i suppose um she is very good at teaching research methods and looking at that concept of it and looking at objectivity and values and looking at how different uh, methods work in different social situations and so on. And then the other member of our social department is actually my head of geography as well. So I have a lot of um, time spent with her, both with geography and sociology, and she brings in a lot of information surrounding. We do global development in year 13, oh, which I know is not one of the most common ones, but because mm. she geography specialist it really works for her but from a perspective of being a non-specialist in a different subject from that perspective I think 
the support that I've had and the fact that my head of department is so organized with everything, it doesn't make it that difficult to get to know it. Like I've got an A-level in geography and a GCSE and so on and my PGC in geography. But I think the level of support the non-specialist needs in terms of looking at it all holistically is just having that patience and remembering that this non-specialist hasn't studied it to the level that I have or my colleagues have in geography or so on. Um, and it's that what I think is the most important surrounding that. So, yeah, you've highlighted really some really interesting points. You said, what is the patience? Um, and I think um, on the sort of thought, like it's, it's not all about me, I'm interested to speak to you, but I'm actually becoming a bit of a non-specialist, uh, well, I say bit, I am a non-specialist, I'm, I'm a sociology teacher, was the former head of sociology, now they teach in sociology, but taking on psychology for the first time this year. And it's that sort of thing, go, do you, do you mind me asking again? Like this, you've got like, but yeah, patience is key. Because you go, I know you've just told me this, but I just want to make it right. So there's sort of that yeah. element that you just mentioned. Um, you also mentioned that it's that idea of being super organised is really important. So from a head of department's point of view, and place, you know, the person who's receiving the support is to have that organisation sort of working ahead so you're not going knocking on the door I suppose uh, on the Monday morning going I've got lesson two um, how do you teach I don't know I'm trying to think something in the family like gender roles within the family or something like that um, and then another point I think you both mentioned there is Paul also mentioned the same is the fact that it's, it's drawing upon the specialism within your department so yeah. in the same way that Paula was talking about her, the theology teacher you were saying about the geography teacher obviously has chosen global development and I think that's something really worth stressing isn't it that you know we think of non-specialists we think actually I'm I'm actually I'm a teacher and I'm of sociology and I've my degree in but I'm, I'm a non-specialist of uh, I, back in the day we used to have pound politics as an option I, I'm not a specialist of that so actually I suppose it's remembering that that actually they might they might be more specialists than that than me like I don't know about global development for example so you've, you've got the geography teacher teaching that and the theology teacher contributing to the family so so this is, that's a real wealth of experience there, that richness, which is what Paula mentioned. I'm still going to go back to sort of the supporting element. So we've talked about general support. Is there anything else additional, uh, Paula, that maybe either the colleagues within the department or the head of faculty or the, the head of department can offer in regards to supporting uh, a non-specialist? Because I know from personal experience, I'm feeling a bit of like, Ooh, I can't do this, the student's going to find me out. Um, I don't want to keep on looking on the door of the head of department going, please, please, please help me. Um, is there anything else from your previous experience? I think one of the key things is being forthcoming with that support, not having that person having to come and knock on your door. Um, and I don't know if anyone who's doing timetabling is listening to this, but I think looking at your timetabling and thinking about kind of protecting time for co-planning, and having a session a week where there is a co-planning session and you look at it together and that's just that should just be a given if somebody's teaching outside their subject specialism and it might take a little bit more effort on the timetablers perspective but just having that protected time where it's like i'm going to invest in you because i want you to be comfortable in what you're teaching and i want you to be happy when you come into um when you walk into that lesson but then in that time thinking about kind of strategies you can use to um to support your uh to support your colleague as well so um like i think about when i was teaching we i used to use elements of flipped learning and one of the things that uh that entailed was independent reading for the students um and they got a kind of a, a cordell note-taking page that went with it so they had headings on these are the things i want them to take away from each chapter and they had to read the text and then kind of make their notes on it and one of the things that you can work on then actually is say to your colleague can you prepare this template and actually you need to read the text and think about what are the important what's the important knowledge here what's the core knowledge that you want the students to take away from it and because that is one of the and i think this is what we have to realize when we have a non-specialist teacher the fundamentals, the kind of pedagogical fundamentals are there. They bring that teaching expertise. It's the knowledge that we're trying to help them build. And that was just one strategy that kind of helped to read this chunk of text, just process it. That's going to form the basis of the next lesson. And you, as you go along, you're developing that worksheet that goes along with it. And that any questions that you have from that, we can use then um, and take into the co-planning session and do a bit of sense making on it and work together to make sure 
you're fully confident in that information and that knowledge before you actually go into the classroom to teach it then. Yeah, since you mentioned like two, it was like really processing the information you give me just then. I was thinking, right, um, tomorrow I'm going to email and actually I'll have to speak because emailing is like I literally sit next to the person. But that's a really good idea is that co planning meetings. You have heads of department meetings and department time, but actually, does the whole department need that information? No, but the person who's a non specialist might need that time. And I think you also mentioned a really good point around. Uh, the pedagogy is there so you know we are all teachers and I know that, that so that's one of the things I always say don't you everyone's a teacher so like I go no I can't teach maths and I can't teach what's the other one a PE that was the other one I was like no you can't give me that um, I did teach drama for a year though so um, and I loved it um, but anyhow <laughs> um, yeah it's the idea we have got that pedagogic knowledge there so it's not that we're alien to it it's just like you said that knowledge and I just love that tip about the Cornell Nate taking you know, on making sure we digest that information or getting now uh, non-specialists to do that um so it's a really sort of i don't know using your word again for all of those bright sparks there those bright moments of putting those those key things out um but i personally have just taken quite a lot from that actually i'm like mm, i'm gonna do that tomorrow for my my my, my personal sort of career journey in regards to sort of the sort of hiccups i mean obviously we want to stay on the positives and so in some ways it's quite nice to know what they are preempt them aren't they before they even happen um i mean so come to care of something it's like i'm sort of like she's like oh we're gonna ask me this question uh, but we know we've spoken about this and we've looked, we've talked about this already with regards to sort of um potential hiccups you know sort of preempting things that might be difficult for a non-specialist i think that was what sort of paul was sort of suggesting earlier that it's better to that the head of the department the colleagues sort of come and approach that conversation rather than the other way around. Are there things that we, we should be preempting that a non specialist might be concerned or worried about that you've experienced in, in yourself? I think because sociology is such a unique subject and a lot of people don't understand it in terms of how it's so grey and how mm. it's so ambiguous, I think is the word for it as well, especially with the specification for AQA. Um, you kind of there's guidance, but there's not as much guidance as, say, geography or psychology or something like that. There's a little less for you to work with. And I think for a non-specialist, reading that spec, it would be quite daunting. And I think understanding that spec and understanding that you can manipulate it to what you think would be the most interesting for your pupils to learn surrounding that topic is something a non-specialist would really, really find difficult. And coming in from someone who has only taught sociology for a year done a degree in it so I've got that background knowledge seeing the spec and noticing how my colleagues are not in that specialism you can see that that ambiguity is quite difficult when most subjects are very black and white clear answers but I think the big hiccup there is the fact that it's such society changes all the time and it's really hard to solidify what you need to learn in sociology and what the kids really need to know and it's down to you as a specialist to sort of advise in some way when there are areas for room for improvement and hiccups, I suppose. Oh, that's really well well, well said. Like, so, like honestly, that's really because sometimes it's really hard because you know, like you said, uh, with sociology, that that is quite ambiguous, quite grey, and. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I suppose the, the the mark schemes or the specifications, whether you're doing OCR, whether you do AK, okay, whatever it might be, whatever. I suppose that, that lots of different places that supply um, the sociology information. It's basically is like that. Like you said, it's because of the fact that society is always changing, so it's not something that can be tied down, and it will you have to stay on top of your game, sort of thing in that respect. And I sort of I suppose you take that for granted because I can sense from talking to you, and I know I've spoken to you already, Kerry, it's your passion for sociology, and so it almost becomes not part of the job. It's something we do anyhow. So it's like us sorting out some information. It's like, oh, this is interesting, this is interesting. But if you're not a non if you're a non-specialist, it might not be part of your sort of um I don't know, pattern of behaviour sort of thing. I, I, I know I always tune all sociology into every conversation I possibly can. Um even if I'm like going out for dinner and they're like, how on earth have you got sociology? Yeah, yeah, like it's constantly evolving. Um with the, thank you for that. So with 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 Paula, with regards to sort of it was everything you thought, oh, that's something else we could do, that's something else we could preempt. So, so Keris has come up really, really well there. But is there anything else that we think, oh, goodness, that, that's worth preempting, not just the sort of the grey area? Um, is there anything else there? Um, so kind of, I suppose it was, it's about like thinking about what are the things that they need to know up front 
um, and kind of pacing ourselves as well. So I, I talked about the, the co-planning element of it, but right from the get go, there's so much kind of in schools around sociology and what it is and what the subject focuses on. And I think from the get go, being very clear with um, any colleagues that joined the department, what kind of what's the vision for sociology? What is it that underpins what you do in that department, and why do you do it? So really being clear on that and sharing that when colleagues join, um, I think is crucial so that then they kind of that shared mental model as you move forward, you're all working along the same lines. And then with that comes being very clear about kind of um, knowing what comes next, the sequence, what what topics, what's the core topics, being very clear with them so they know this is what happens. And then what are the optional topics? Why have we chosen those? Why have we looked at, um, because in when I took over as head of department um, in my school, I, I changed the topics and it was, uh, and then it was about when colleagues joined the department, it was about explaining why, why do we have those topics and what sequence do we teach them in and why do we teach them in that sequence? How do they build on each other? How do they um, complement each other and kind of that knowledge as cumulative at the end of it? And then the assessment process as well, so that they're very clear from the start what is the assessment process because being a non-specialist as well so um I, I often used to describe myself as a humanities teacher because i've taught everything that comes under that umbrella and more uh, and it used to be that thing of oh what's the exam going to look like or what's the what comes after this what's next whereas i think making sure that we have in place kind of that very big picture thinking from the start so that people know where they have an idea of where they're going next and then kind of the, the short term slots into that and complements it. But they kind of they know the fundamentals of what's happening uh, in the department. So I think that's just something to consider as well, that upfront information and knowledge. Well, thank you for that. Because so, yeah, it's so, I mean, we obviously think, you know, head it all makes sense, the sort of schemes of work and, you know, your sort of visions and values, whatever you want to sort of put, uh, you know, curriculum journey, the buzzwords at the moment. But actually, there is a merit to all of that because although you know what you want to do, even if you've got specialists in your department, it's really important that they know where we're going with that. And I think, like you said about the assessment journey as well, um, more so I suppose for something like sociology because it's so hugely synoptic. Um, I also taught uh, that sort of A level stand for other subjects particularly, but you know it's very synoptic. So you know you're looking at the family, you look at all overlap with education, we look at crime, or you know there's so many overlaps. So it's thinking about that vision and putting it all together and, and looking at where you're assessing across you know topics or you can use old knowledge from something else. So it really makes sense there. So thank you. That's really sort of, there's so much more. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. So there's lots of ideas there that you can pull across. So the last thing I want to come across, and I know I'm going to look at this, I'm actually doing a, a podcast on this in a couple weeks' time, I think it's next week actually, um, and I know we've spoken about it. I just want to talk about it briefly, sort of the final ideas to talk about was sort of this imposter syndrome. Um, I know there's something I want to spend a lot more time talking about, as I said, but is there any sort of things that, because I think, have, uh, particularly non-specialists, I think they're more likely to sort of suffer that, maybe, I'm just making that assumption, maybe sort of early career teachers as well, or teachers that are trainees. Any sort of thoughts on that, of how, as a sort of head of department or as a colleague, that we can sort of support that teacher in sort of reducing that, uh, that those feelings? Um, Chris. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to jump at it, but, oh, um, <laughs> but um, in terms of imposter syndrome, I think it depends on how long people have been teaching it. Obviously, my colleagues, my head of department and um, my head of geography is also a sociology teacher. They've been teaching far longer than me and they've had the experience of teaching sociology far longer than me, even though that they're not specialists. Mm. And I think that there is an element of it's that extra subject sometimes. It's not verbally said, but you can see that, for example, my head of department is psychology and sociology and her major is psychology. So that's the thing that she's more passionate about, I suppose. Whereas with my uh, head of department for geography, she's the same, but with geography. But both of them, they're both really keen to develop the department. And I've, from my own experience with them, there's not really a level of imposter syndrome that I've noticed. It's more mm. of a, we need to work a bit harder towards this because it's not our specialism. But 
if the fact that they're a specialist in their pedagogy because they've been teaching for such a long time, we sort of all bounce off each other. I'm there with the knowledge whilst they're with the ability to teach and sort of train me in that way. So it's quite a nice relationship, I suppose, in that way. Yeah, a little trade off on both sides. Like you said, like there's that sort of idea. Well, actually, I might not know a lot about sociology, but you can help me out with this. And I, I know a bit more about pedagogy. And so if, again, it's that sort of common thing that we both, been, all three of us have been talking about today is the both you've been talking about is the idea of putting on people's strengths. Um, mm -hmm. So theirs might be the pedagogy and the experience of, of teaching and they can pass that on to you. Um, any sort of final thoughts from you, Paul? Is there anything you could add to that um, or you can think of that might help those that might be feeling a bit of like, oh, I can't do this, that sort of imposter syndrome? Any final thoughts? I think Karis has kind of touched on it there by describing how, how our uh, department works and how they collaborate together, but it's about creating that relational trust so that when you are working together, you're pulling together as a team because you want to do better and you want, and it all comes back to the pupils, right? You want the best for your mm. pupils. And what you can do then when you're pulling together is create that environment and that climate in your department where that people feel they feel okay to be vulnerable and they feel okay to say, I don't get it or I'm not sure um, about this part of it. And what that helps to do is when that imposter syndrome comes on and they feel like, oh God, it's it's Marxism and I've never taught this before. Um, it, it's not something that becomes crippling. It's not something that becomes stress or anxiety inducing. It becomes something that's like, I haven't taught this before. It's a split second, I feel like I can't teach it, but I'm gonna go down the corridor and I'm gonna put in a meeting after uh, at X time and I'm gonna talk through it. And I know by the end of it that I'll come out and I'll be confident in it and I'll be able to do it. Um, and it's just about creating that culture and climate where that becomes every day and that's how how people work together. Oh, please be said. I uh, wish you were still like a head of department. You're like, there were lots of, you know, lots of the social world of sociology there. Because, yeah, trust is like the key, isn't it? With any sort of, with, with everything, actually, like you know, on lots of different levels within uh, teaching and learning and sort of making sure that, like you said, the, the, the centre of that is, is putting the students first. So on that note, thank you ever so much for both of you for your time. I appreciate for Keris, this is your sort of first day back after the summer holidays, so it's like a bit of shock to the system. Um, and thank you, Paula, for your insight and your expertise. Um, so I've got my brain thinking, I'm like, da -da 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 -da, sort of selfishly thinking, right, how can I how can I put this into place myself? But thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise, as I've said already. And um, hopefully we can I can touch base with you again, get some more knowledge and some ideas from you because it was it was brilliant. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you. You take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.